Hey, you're not Ashley. Nope, I'm Zach. This is Zach from Swiss Septics, and he is here to tell us all about installing a septic system in Cochise County. And as you'll see from the problem after problem after problem that we ran into, probably just should have hired him. But if you want to DIY your own septic, this is the video for you. So back when we moved to our property, as part of getting our permit to build the house, we had to have our soil, soil eval. Soil eval. <laughs> I keep wanting to call it a, you call it a perk test? Perk test, soil eval, yeah. Yeah, same thing. Three holes they dig to test like the type of soil you have so that they know what your... Soil absorption rate is. Thank you, yes. Now this was all fine and good until we actually got to working on our house here and designing it, we realized we wanted a much bigger house than what we actually permitted the subject for. The original person who dug the holes wouldn't call us back and we just happened to be talking to Zach and realized he ran his own septic company and he could help us out. Before we knew it, he was reapplying for our permit and giving us materials lists and answering far too many questions. I kind of blew up her phone. Sorry about that. It's all good. <laughs> so before we get into all of the basics of septic systems, I'm gonna let Zach tell you about his company. Hello, I'm Zach with Smith Septic Service. Uh, we serve all of Cochise County and Southern Arizona. We do designs, installations, pumping, inspections, you name it, anything septic wise, we handle it. You also answer texts from random people about septic systems. Yes, I do. <laughs> but don't do that to him. So let's start at ground zero, the soil evaluation. Required for everybody, no matter what kind of septic system you're gonna do, composting, traditional, what exactly does that involve? Smith Septic will come out to your property and we will bring our equipment out. We will dig a series of three holes. Uh, two in the primary area, and one in a backup area or expansion area if you ever need to expand. Okay. From those test holes, we will do a soil classification and assign your soil a soil absorption rate from that point. From there, I can take that information coupled with your floor plan and your site plan that you have. It can be a rough sketch. It can be a full on CAD drawing. I've gotten drawings on toilet paper. <laughs> of just awesome. where the house is going to be. I just have to know where the house is going to be to decide the best location for the septic. Based off your drawings and the location of the house and that soil absorption rate, I put together a packet for you to get your permit. Um, it consists of all the ADEQ paperwork, the soil breakdown, the septic design sheet, which is actually the blueprint of the septic, right? Yep. and then a site plan. All of that paperwork is what you need to get your permit with the county. Okay, and just for reference, you guys charge how much to come out and dig those holes and file all that paperwork? We charge $750 for the paperwork. Um, from that point, I can either submit it for the permit, yeah, which is $300, or you can do it yourself. Right, the $300 is like what you as the homeowner have to pay to yes. have that permit. That is correct. So no matter how much of this system you want to DIY, this is the one step, at least in Cochise County, that you can't do by yourself. You have to have someone certified like Zach. So let's start with sizing your tank. How do you arrive at the size septic tank you need when you're doing this process? Well, first off, the size of the tank is determined by your number of bedrooms and bathrooms. Okay. With that, your five bedrooms, that assigns it a 750 gallon per day flow rate, meaning a 1500 gallon tank. So once you have that math, you can plug that in and then it tells you how many chambers you need yes. or perforated pipe or whatever technology you're going with, but you have to have that first number yep. to get to the second number. That same flow rate plugged into a formula with your soil absorption rate, which we achieved in your soil eval. In this case, it's a 0 0.8, 750 gallons per day. All of that coupled together tells me how big to design your system for you personally. A couple of other important things that we ran into as issues. Distances from not only your house, but also your property lines. Setbacks. <laughs> setbacks, yes. Setbacks are crucial. <laughs> setbacks meaning, you know, the minimum setback from a building is 10 feet. That means you can't be within that 10 feet. You've got to be out at least that far. Okay. Property lines, um, in most cases, depending on where you are, it can be either A, five feet, provided the property beside you has a developed water system or not. If it does not and it's vacant land, it's got to be 50. And that's where we ran into problems because it is a vacant lot. Uh, and so the I guess the idea is that if someone were to ever move in there 
and put a water system in, then our septic would be too close to their water system and it yes. wouldn't, wouldn't be good. They, the drill, well driller would have to drill 50 feet on, on their side, yeah. creating that 100 foot setback from a well to, to your septic, right. any part of your septic. So I, that's another thing. If you have a well on your property, that also has to be a certain yes, distance from the septic. You still have to be 100 feet from septic. <laughs> okay. One of the other critical setbacks is from washes. If the wash drains more than 20 acres, um, it's an established wash, then the setback from that is 50 feet. Okay, that's that's good to know. So the other important thing, and you may remember when we were building uh, the Casa de Caca, was that we knew we were gonna plumb that into the septic tank and that we had to get the drop right. The drop was crucial and it was really a pain because we had to go under our swale, which is dug down 18 inches. Thankfully, there was some natural drop on the property and you're supposed to go a quarter inch per foot. So by the time we got down there, it was almost two feet that the inlet had to be dropped below grade into the ground to get that drop to work from all the way up at the outhouse. A conventional septic system is gravity. Uh, meaning that it uses gravity to get from the source to the tank, to the D-box, out into your leach fields. So elevations are critical. So once it reaches the tank, your D-box, you have your outlet, you're right, it's gonna, there's gonna be a drop from the outlet to the D-box. From the D-box to the bottoms of the trenches in your leach field, is all gonna be lower. It's gonna step down as you go out from the tank. Yeah, and so we had our tank hole dug down two feet lower than it probably would have been if we didn't have this other outhouse project and we were just coming from the house but it was kind of a rough dig so we had to get down in there make sure it was very level and and smooth and ready for that tank to be set down in we just got word that the septic is finally on its way. So I'm gonna go over here to our septic holes. Uh, gonna walk you through it real quick. We're gonna make sure everything is still good and it's ready for them to set it in. Okay, so the problem with our super sandy soil is that a pit like this is constantly losing material. So I've been in this several times trying to get the sides evened out and there's still stuff that keeps just trickling down. It's going to be a pretty tricky process to set this whole thing in here. I'm going to pull my level out, check the edges again. Hopefully we'll be good when they get here in a few minutes. It is finally happening. The septic is here and we're gonna get it installed with the help of Pidia. Once your pit is prepped, the septic tank install is pretty straightforward. Besides making sure that it's pointed the right direction, you just want to make sure that it's level both side to side and front to back. One thing that Padilla actually told us we should do is put some water in the septic tank because if it were to rain too much, that tank could actually float up and move out of its place and then it wouldn't be level anymore. It would be a whole thing to have to redo it. So we filled it up halfway just as the storm was coming in. Because our tank was buried so far underground, we got these risers to raise up the inspection port so that we could still get to them without having to dig everything up again. So once your tank is in the ground, you're not done, unfortunately. You still have to have an area for the water that goes through the septic system to leach out 
into leach field and then it goes down your soil and filters out and it does the whole thing. But there's lots of different ways you can do that, right? Yes, there's there's two types of uh, leach field systems that we utilize here in Cochise County. One being your, your rock and pipe system and the other being infiltrator. In your case, we have infiltrators in the ground. Right, and so these are these sort of half circle shaped plastic domes yes. that all get interlocked together in a really long trench and they actually as i asked you about this the other day they actually have holes in the top which i thought was kind of weird they are louvered so yes. so explain like the the idea of this water goes into this this cavity and and then what happens like what's the purpose of that so when when you're all said and done and you install these chambers you have a three foot wide by whatever the length of your leach line is Boy, half circle, if you will. Water comes in from the D-box, drops down into the end cap, and percolates. Not only do you get percolation down, but you also get evaporation up and out. I know you said you do a lot of these chamber installs versus the rock and pipe. Why, what's the difference? Why would you choose one over the other? <clears throat> I found it case, case by case basis. Um, I found that rock and pipe, the materials are a little cheaper, but they're more labor intensive. Okay. Uh, the infiltrators are a little more expensive, but a lot less labor. If I've got tight quarters to work with, I'll generally go rock and pipe. If I've got a large chunk of land and no restrictions on what I have to work with, then I'll do chambers. Just a quick break in this video to say thank you to our homies. These are our tiny shiny homies, the names you see on the screen. They're the people that help support us every single month. And we know not everybody can be a homie and that's totally fine. Just by liking this video, watching it, sharing, subscribing, all of that helps us too. Yep, so the names are almost finished mm -hmm. and I would like to wrap up this septic. How about you? I've been wanting to wrap it up for three months. Okay, let's get back to it. So that brings us to our major set of problems with the, our particular septic install is that with our soil type and based on the size of our house and our bedrooms and all that, we needed two 72 foot leach lines going out with these chambers in them. Now you can see based on this overhead view that that would have put us into our neighbor's property. That wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but the cool thing is that you can start dividing them. So yes. explain how that works. So your system called for two 72 footers, as you mentioned. Right. What I did is I broke it up into four, okay. four lines. Yeah. And as long as you meet that minimum square footage that the soil eval told me that I needed to have, you can break it up into four trenches, you can break it up into five trenches, as long as you got that equal distribution. In some cases, when you break it down, you've got to add chambers to get the to get equal lengths on each on each line. Uh, and that was one problem we ran into is is we we needed like half an extra chamber, and so it actually extended the length of all of the trenches longer than we thought because you you can't count the end caps right. as part of that square footage. Yes, which we didn't know. <laughs> Chambers only. <laughs> Chambers only, yeah. And those, they add about two feet each, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So when you're digging a three foot wide by four, five foot deep trench, and now you got to go back another four feet, that's an enormous amount of dirt to move by hand, which is where we just ran out of gas and we had to call Zach to come help us. So when, when you see the design on the paperwork, I'll generally lay it out, what we say, 272 footers, yep. okay? When in actuality, he needed 274 footers to... Mm -hmm counting the end caps but right. ADEQ does not give you credit for the end caps it's the chambers only and so by DIYing it I sort of missed that crucial bit of info where if you came out you would have just come out and dug them and popped everything in it would have been fine you would have seen the pitfalls of being too close to the fence line or not being far enough or whatever but we were just going off of it's a 36 foot trench we're gonna measure 50 feet and then come up and then we ran into issues because then all of a sudden we're digging too far out and yep. we're having to move everything back and it turned into a whole thing. Should have called Zach. Should have called Zach. <laughs> The infiltrator system, because we did a bunch of ourselves and it was really pretty straightforward. I mean, it's just these chambers and they kind of lock into place. When we come out and we dig them, we, we get all our elevations and we dig our way out, but we're, we're raking the bottom of the trench and we're laying the chambers as we go. Right, and it's important that that trench is, is flat and level nice and flat. all the way down, right? That is correct, okay. yes. So when you lay the chambers, one chamber will lay in like this and then 
once we rake out a little farther, dig a little farther, and we're laying the chambers, this next chamber will come in and lay on top and clip in. The chambers have these little plastic clips that lock them together. Okay. And then you're supposed to put some like dirt on the side. Yeah, right? just kind of keep just them knock from down moving some around. Dirt. Yes. Yeah. It's pretty easy. I was surprised. I thought it was going to be like a whole thing. Okay, let's talk about a few other important things that I didn't know about uh, digging trenches <laughs> for these infiltrators. One of the things is key things is the separation between the trenches. A infiltrator specifically states minimum of five feet between the trenches. Now they also have a minimum coverage over the top, which means the minimum amount of dirt you can have over top the chamber is 12 inches. Hmm. Now. Infiltrator also states that the max amount of dirt you can have over top of the chamber is eight feet. Because you don't want to break the, you I mean, they're just yeah, made out of plastic. They're, yeah. they're, it's ABS, yes. Yeah. So before I sent you a message and asked you about this, we were doing researches online. We're like, how far apart do you put your infiltrator trenches? And the, you know, the first answer Google threw up was one foot. Uh, <laughs> and that was not correct. And I'm glad that we asked because I guess here in our soil, in Arizona at least, they have different recommendations yes. um, to put these things in. So don't always trust Google. Yeah, we follow the manufacturer's installation instructions on the installation of the chambers. That's why you call Zach. So like I said earlier, the, the trenches for this were really our biggest problem because we had them pre-dug based on our measurements, which weren't quite correct. They weren't deep enough, long enough. They were the right distance apart, yes. thankfully, but our sandy soil also meant they were caving in on each other. It turned into a whole thing. So Zach was nice enough to come out and dig that last like four to six feet with his three foot bucket. It took like no time. See, when you have the right tools. That's why we are Smith Septic. <laughs> Now the final part of this is the distribution box, or as you like to call it, the D-box. There's a lot of things I did not know about the D-box, and it caused almost caused us to have to redo the whole thing. One thing about the D-box is that it's typically set on native undisturbed soil, so that if you do get some settling, the D-box is not going to shift. The D-box is just what it is. It's a point of distribution for the effluent coming out of the tank, and it's equally distributed to however many lines you have via leveler, speed levelers is what right. we call them so in the D-box. It's got to come out of the tank and drop, yep. and then out of the D-box, then it also has to drop yes. to all of your chambers or your rock and pipe or whatever. Yep. Whatever, whatever leach field you have, ADEQ mandates that we have equal distribution to each trench. Getting the D-box on native soil and getting it level is another critical point. If you don't get it level, you're not going to get equal distribution. Uh, you're going to flood one line, you're going to be calling somebody in four or five years being like, my septic's failing, <laughs> and all of your effluent's being channeled to that one trench and not equally distributed to the others. So the thing that frustrated me the most when we started looking at this is the thin wall PVC versus like Schedule 40 versus ABS. Why are there so many different pipes and what are their purposes? Different pipes have different applications. Generally in a septic system, we're using Schedule 35 thin wall. Uh, unless I'm caught crossing a driveway. If I'm crossing a driveway, or I've got a lot of heavy traffic crossing the main line going to the tank, mm. then I'll use a thicker wall pipe, uh, such as Schedule 40 or ABS. Is there any reason to use ABS versus Schedule 40? It's just a personal preference. Yeah. It can be plumbed with either. Okay. So. so like in our case, we did transfer, because the pipe coming out of the tank is Schedule 35. But we transitioned to ABS to go up to the outhouse because it goes right under our driveway. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that it, it wasn't going to break when we drove over it. Well, one thing to keep in mind is that Lowe's and Home Depot will sell you a four inch sewer line pipe perforated when it comes to rock and pipe. Mm -hmm. That is not acceptable if it's deeper than two feet because that is such a thin wall pipe, thin, yeah. it can crush. So although they say it's sewer line, avoid using it. Gotcha. But we did, coming out of the tank, we did use Schedule 35 to yes. the infiltrators because there's not a lot of flow, um, There's not a, you're not driving over, you shouldn't be driving over it, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> avoid, avoid driving over them if you can. If you gotta turn a trailer around or something periodically, it's not gonna affect it, but uh, avoid it if you can. No high traffic areas. Yes. So connected to the outlet of the septic tank, there's this weird yellow filter thing. What is that? What's its purpose? So that filters in there as a last ditch effort from preventing 
any kind of suspended solids in your tank from getting out into your leach field. Right. That filter should be maintained once a year, pulled out, sprayed out, put back in, because if it gets clogged with solids that get suspended in your tank, it can plug and cause you backups. So in a septic tank, you've got two compartments. You've got the inlet side, you've got the outlet side. There is a baffle, what we call a baffle, divider wall between the two compartments with a hole about halfway up from the floor. As the solids and the waste come into the inlet side, the solids break down and settle to the bottom. Your fat soils and greases, or as we were taught, it's called fog, which is your soap scums, your every, anything that is your shampoos, your, all that stuff will rise to the top. In that center layer is the effluent. That's what transfers over to the outlet side. And so the, the tank is designed to, when you push water in from your source, it's gonna push water out of that, that effluent, that center section, into the D-Box. So that yellow filter is just in case mm -hmm. some of those solids didn't go down to the bottom. They yes. might still be floating and so it catches them as that water comes up and yes. goes out. Yes. One thing we're recommending with the chamber system is an inspection port in the end for two reasons. Uh, one, it lets you as the homeowner know, hey, there's my leach field. And two, it's a point of access to your leach field to check and see if it's full. And that, that goes back to the D-Box and the levelers with equal distribution. You wanna get it equally distributed to all your leach fields. This is the one thing if you're doing the opt-out that you do have to have someone official come out and inspect your work and, and you have to get a passing grade or else you can't use it. That is correct. When, when they come out and look at your installed septic system, what are they looking for? So on the infiltrator systems, it's, it's one inspection. Rock and pipe is generally two. They come out on the rock and pipe and they measure the depth of the trenches. You put rock and pipe in it. They come back and make sure you've got the required depth of gravel underneath your perf pipe. Ah. On the infiltrators, it's one inspection. You dig your trenches, you install your leach fields, you call for the inspection. One thing the inspector's gonna look at, first thing, he's gonna look at your tank. He's gonna put a level on your tank, make sure it's level left to right and front to back. So he's gonna check your D-box. Uh, generally, we leave our D-boxes open with water in them and the speed levelers. He'll generally check your pipes coming out of the D-box to your trenches uh, to make sure you got fall to them. Right. And then he'll walk each trench and make sure you've got the required number of chambers as per plan. Yeah, and he'll also check setbacks and, and yeah. stuff like that. Now, if you hired Zach to come do this, he would submit two extra things at the end of this process, a water tightness test and an as-built plan. I just wanted to jump in here and mention that you can submit both of these things yourself as an owner builder. As-built is very simple. You just measure all your distances, lay it out and send it over. The water tightness test is a little more complicated. You need to put a decent amount of water in your tank, wait 24 hours, come back, measure the level, then wait another hour, measure the level again. And as long as there's no significant difference, then your tank is watertight. You can fill out all that information and sign it and send it in yourself. Once those two things are submitted, the health department will issue a discharge authorization and close your septic permit and you're done. Then you get to cover it back up and not think about it for at least how long? Generally based off the usage, um, obviously you want to maintain that filter uh, once year, a year, right? once yep. a year. Typically the larger households, they a general pump and clean out every three to five years okay. is a good idea. When you pump, you're pumping the solids up, You're right? pumping all the solids, yep. Okay. yep. What about the scum? Does that kind of stay there? Do you worry nope. about that? Nope, our, our company comes out, we, we now do pumping. Okay. Our company comes out and we mix all of that up into a smoothie. Mmm, yum. <laughs> Money. <laughs> we, then we pump it all out. <laughs> and we, we you know once we pump it all out, then you're, you're good for another three to five years. Proper maintenance, as with anything, is key to the longevity of your septic. That's what I'm learning about every single thing on our homestead. Holy smokes. Everything requires maintenance. So much maintenance. Yep. I need like a huge maintenance calendar <laughs> for all the things. So I want to wrap this up because this project took us three months. And when Smith Septic comes out, it takes about a day. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there that, you know, if you want to get it done quick, you can pay some money and get a professional to do it. Or you can be like me and dig in the dirt for three months and then call them anyway. You can find Smith Septics, <laughs> on, the, <laughs> you can find Smith Septics on the web at smithseptics.com 
or on Facebook at Smith Septics LLC. We're just a phone call away. Yes, they are. I know, because I've called them a whole lot. Okay, let's talk about cost real quick. I know you're thinking, did DIYing this septic actually save us money? Well, yeah, it did, of course, because we only paid for materials and not the labor. The cost for all this has nearly doubled in the last couple of years when we got our initial quote to install a 1,000 gallon tank. It was about 5,500, and by the time we were ready to put this in, we paid at least that much just in materials. Obviously, the labor part of that is gonna vary based on your soil type, and if you go rock and pipe versus the infiltrators and how much gravel you gotta bring in. But right now, in 2023, I would ballpark a system like this probably in the 10 to 12,000 range. Another option here in the county is a composting system. So you would use a composting toilet, but you still have to supplement with a smaller septic tank system. Those usually run about four to $6,000 and you would need to talk to Zach or to the county about the specifics of how all that works. So yeah, we did save some cash up front, but we wasted a lot more time. So you just got to decide which is more important to you. Dude, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Been, I know it's all, been fun. I know a lot of people are gonna really benefit from knowing how this process works and benefit from knowing someone they can call when it goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always open to phone calls. If, if you got questions, you can find me, reach out. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Awesome. All right, that's it. We'll see you next time. You have to get a septic test hole, right? A septic test. Soil eval. You have to get a soil eval. It's like, it's not a hole, it's three hole. I know that. <laughs> just correct him every yeah, time. Yeah, you should just correct me every time. Dump it, bring it back down. That's dumb. It's real dumb. It flows the second chamber. Those solids should float to the ground. Right, then... You keep saying float to the ground. They can't float to the ground. Oh. Settle. Settle to the ground. <laughs> okay. Dude, that was Sorry. a lightning bolt. The, Did you see that? Uh, I saw it on the corner of my It was eye. like... <laughs> Arizona Department of Environmental Quality. Oh, gosh. Now you're <laughs> Math. You gotta call somebody certified like Zach to actually... Publish? Submit? Uh, no. To, to, to not file? Fill not file would be like submitting. <laughs> Assemble? To, to fill out. How about we just talk, say that you have to do this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Frog in my throat. D-box, which in turn's pushing... Pushes, pushes that foot out You're like, to call me. Yeah, if you would have just called him. <laughs> you'd be like, if you would have just called me. <laughs>